Assalamu alaikum. So we know I'm, I'm, I'm Akhil Ahmed, a uh, very humble man, obviously. Um, and uh, we've, we've got all the introductions, so there's no point me going through it all over again. So I'm just going to throw it out there straight away with the first question of this conversation. And that is to say to the Baroness, Saida, what does this tell us about the role of Islam in, in the UK in particular? Um. Uh, well, Asalaamu Alaikum and uh, good morning and uh, as I was saying to our guest earlier, there is a God, what a beautiful day in the middle of uh, September for this to be uh, taking place. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you all. This is such an important question at a time when certainly as politicians we consistently try to bring forward policies where we create a sense of ease between communities. Nowhere has that been most difficult to establish. Uh, certainly as policy makers, but the sense of ease between Britain and Islam and Muslims and Britain. Um, and what it was so wonderful to hear uh, from Tim uh, today, uh, who, uh, who is an incredibly shy man, but if you get the opportunity, go on YouTube and watch the happy video. It's certainly worth watching him uh, do the, uh, the Pharrell happy video. Is that Tim puts into context what so many of us have been saying for a very, very long time, which is that Islam has been here for a very, very long time. Um, and so often when we talk about it being an awkward, alien existence within Britain, Islam was within 300 miles of Dover in, eighth, in the 8th century. Uh, this concept of this being a new relationship is, is simply wrong, historically wrong. And the more we can contextualize the relationship of not just Muslims and Islam, but other minority communities, the more likely we're going to be able to understand that actually Britain is ultimately made up of, of a nation of lots of people who came here, came here probably at different times. Um, and to again, I mean, put it into context, there's a fantastic uh, video from a comedian uh, where he talks about UKIP. Um, and he talks about people coming over here and taking our jobs, etc. So, uh, if you watch it, it kind of sets into context how literally Britain is made up of lots of people who arrived here and over time created the identity that we now call British identity. What does it tell us, John, about in terms of our, our identity the, and, our, and the politics of our identity as well? Well, I think it's, if we take a step back and just think about national identity for a moment, um, it's a very strange thing. I mean, as Tim showed brilliantly, you know, try and pin it down, it's a bit slippery. On the other hand, national identities are capable of driving hugely powerful and strong emotions. So it is a real thing. And two things about identities. One is, they're in our heads, but they're a collection of stories that tell us, that we share, that tell us who we are. Um, what we share, how we all came to be here, what we have in common, what we want to do. And that's a mixture of geography and family and shared history, maybe our sense of the environment and the music and all the rest of it. And the challenge here, I think, is, is there an Englishness which is wholly accepting of Islam? And is there an Islam that is wholly comfortable to be English? And the reason why that's important is, is two things. One is, for reasons I won't go to a great length, but right across the Western world, um, the politics of, sort of nation and place and identity are becoming more powerful rather than less powerful. Um, and sometimes, as with the extreme right, that is very dangerous and threatening, but it's out there. And we've either, we've got a choice really of trying to make the national identities that work, that include everybody, or end up with a rather divided national identity which shuts some people out. That's what I think the exercise is. And then the second thing I make is that identities aren't discovered. You can't keep going back and back in history to find the, the true identity. I mean, if you want to look at the history of Britain, the history of England, you will find all sorts of things there that I wouldn't want to be part of Britishness or Englishness today. I mean, the, 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 the Britain that I was born into, the England that I was born into in Devon in 1950s was a deeply racist place. Okay, it was when I grew up. Racism was taken for granted as one of the things you did. Britain has changed enormously over that period of time. So I think the challenge here, and that's actually what you're doing. I mean, if, 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 if nations are made, not discovered, then things like this are part of building. 
It's interesting. You, most people have been talking about an English identity or an English Islam. Is it different to? Because obviously, when we look, when Tim was talking about some of the um, the research that's been done, is generally people from diverse backgrounds, particularly Muslims, they identify with being British rather than identifying with being English. Now, I know we come from the you know the, the, the identifying with being a Lancastrian, identifying with being a Yorkshire person. Uh, Yorkshire person, not a Yorkshire friend. Um, in that sense, we, the identities that we have, I know we're supposed to have all these multiple identities, but for some reason, Brit Muslims identify with being British, yet we're talking here about an English identity. Why is that? I think this is a really important exercise. I think British Islam uh, and discussions around British Islam have certainly been around for about 15 years now, and uh, various organisations, including the Islamic Society of Britain, actually led much of that work in, in terms of trying to create an identity for Muslims which was comfortably British. And then I think uh, devolution post-Brexit has thrown up a whole series of further challenges. I mean, if you look at the polling around Brexit, many people who voted to leave the European Union, when they were asked about their identity, identified as English rather than as British. Um, and in a, in a more devolved Britain and in a post-Brexit Britain, I think the English identity is far stronger. Interestingly, um, I was speaking to colleagues from Scotland actually only last week. The sense of Scottish Muslim identity is so much stronger than a English British identity. Um, it, it's something that I think is going to develop over the coming years. It's something that has to develop in a more nationalistic space, as, uh, as John has said. But it's something which Tim referred to is not new. The phrase that I always use is that, yeah, and the phrase that I grew up with, was that Islam is like a river. It takes the color of the bed over which it flows. And my Islam flows over Yorkshire and over England. And therefore, it is quite right that over time, as Islam takes the color of the space in which it finds itself, whether it is around the world or here, it will start to reflect a very clear Englishness. But to do that, the bed must know what it represents. You see, my color will only reflect what the bed is. And if the bed is a slightly murky gray and doesn't really know what it stands for, then my Islam is going to be just as confused and murky gray because it's going to flow over a very confused bed. Um, and it's something, politicians are terrible at saying, I made a speech on this many years ago, but I made a speech on this back in 2012. Um, when I said that for, for um, minority faiths to feel truly comfortable about who they are, the majority is going to be sure about who it is. And certainly in a kind of post-Christian phase, which again Tim referred to, um, a, a Europe that was much sure about its own Christian heritage was a much easier place to be a Muslim. A Europe which is entering a new phase where Christianity is generally on the decline, and Anglicanism certainly is on the decline, it's much harder to be a minority faith. And I think these are really important discussions for us to, to, to get right over the next few years. Can I add a point just to follow up? I, I agree with what Saeed has said. Um, the couple of things about Britishness. I, I, I think that there is a very patriotic Britishness, and one manifestation of it only was the last night of the proms yeah. on television on Saturday night. But there's also a Britishness which is more a straightforward citizenship. You know, it's what it says on the passport. I've got the passport, I agree to sign up for the laws, that's the beginning and end of my, my, my Britishness. So, in a diverse society, and that goes back, you know, certainly to Queen Victoria, in the middle of the 19th century, very undemanding, uh, in faith terms, idea of what it was to be associated with Britain. So it's quite a flexible identity. And let's be honest, the trouble with Englishness is that it's, it isn't that grey area. You talk to some people, and it's very, they make it very clear their idea of being English is it's ethnic, it's white. You know, the extremist groups like the English Defence League actually define English as not including Islam in particular. But there's an Englishness which is very different, very very much more like the Scottishness the Scots have tried to create, which is appropriately if you live here and you feel English and you want to be English, you're English. And I think this is this is a dynamic process, do you think? Is this not a matter of academic study? How do you build that Englishness, which is the England that belongs to everybody who lives in England and who wants to be English? And I think that's what we've got to do, and that will make it easier for people who currently say, well, I'm, I'm sure about being British, but I'm not sure about being English, to feel they're invited to the, 
to the event. So it's a two-way process. It's not a simple thing like, can the Muslim community find an English Islam? It's can the rest of the English community find an Englishness that fully accepts that Islam is part of that, has been for a long time, and even if it hadn't been, it's going to be for the future. Well, actually, well, actually, <laughs> well, no, the question I was going to say was actually, well, why can it? Why does it not exist in the first? Why is this English identity so different to, say, a British identity that a Muslim finds it really uncomfortable? Because it's not just about the EDL or the organisations which have only been going for a few years. This is been, this is something which has been there for a long time. So why? What's the specific thing about English identity and Islam's relationship with or British Muslims' relationship okay. today? that makes it difficult for us. Nobody has a problem saying they're British. Okay, I think there are two things coming out of it historically. One is that the Englishness that is emerging at the moment is increasingly strong. 70% of people who are English residents describe themselves as English in the last census. So this is not a minority thing. And all the evidence is that the numbers of people primarily describe themselves as English and the intensity of feeling English has grown over the last 20 years. So I said that's partly because the power of Britain, because there's no empire as a symbol, isn't as strong as it used to be. If the Welsh are the Welsh, the Scots are the Scots, and the Irish are the Irish, who are we? People are asking. People ask the same thing in the question of the EU. So you've got Englishness, it's not settled, it's emerging. And secondly, overlaid with that is a history, which I acknowledged earlier, in British history, of association with racist attitudes, which are changing and have changed dramatically in my lifetime, but have not entirely got out of the system yet. So this is a work in process. And you, you can't take it as a fixed thing and say, England today is the way England will always be. Have things changed dramatically in the right direction in the last 20, 30 years? I would say yes, but not perfectly, with some slipping back. There isn't nationalism, if you want to call it that. If you look at any particular kind of empire, or any grouping of people together, what tends to happen is in that at some point, people within that empire or within that grouping of nations decide that they want out or they want more control over their own identity. So when we talk about nationalism, we may be talking, looking at what's happening in Europe or we're looking at what's happening in England for that matter, and we refer to it as nationalism. But isn't it people purely exerting their desire to be taken as an equal? As, a, or as opposed to being a member of a larger supergroup or being a member of an empire. So how are we getting it wrong when we talk about nationalism? Because actually, can't we help us have our own, our own relationship with that subject as well? Yeah. Well, in politics, this is a really confused subject. I mean, we've had discussions around uh, English votes for, uh, uh, for an English parliament, uh, in only English MPs voting for certain laws that don't affect um, Scotland. I think the uh, referendum in Scotland brought up that Englishness, but it seems to me, for me, I think English nationalism has never been a positive, encompassing kind of movement. It's always been quite a defensive, exclusionary movement. And that's why I think English Islam has been much more difficult to speak about than British Islam. And my Yorkshire identity is far, far stronger than my English identity. So I go from my very strong Yorkshire identity to my very strong British identity and kind of leapfrog the Englishness in between. I think there was a fascinating thing, which again, British Future and others have been involved in around the St. George's Cross with its strong connections to both Palestine and Turkey and other parts of what is now the, um, the Muslim world. Uh, to say that in a way the symbol of Englishness is so rooted in the Middle East and, 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 um, and Islam that there are lots of spaces where people can start to link in their Islamic identity. Ultimately, it will boil down to two very simple, simple things which most identities uh, break down into and it's something which I'm writing about at the moment and it's this. It, will an English identity allow me to belong? And will, a, will an English identity mean that I matter in that identity? And I think when you feel that you both matter and belong, it's very easy to take on that identity. Um, whereas if you feel that you neither matter, neither matter nor belong, it's going to be a much harder process. And I think certainly for politicians, we consistently need to find policies which allow people to matter and to belong. And beyond the policies, anything else? Or history, history education? education? Yeah, history, education. I mean, so on the nationalism, I mean, I think the language you go around and around circles, there is a big difference between loving your country 
I would say I love England and I love Britain, and saying I think England or Britain is better than anybody else. And the danger of nationalism is when you start to say, not only do I love my country, but my country is better than anybody else's, and I've got the right to tell other people what to do or to discriminate against them. So it's keeping in that area. And by and large, in the English identity, there are lots of people who want to be recognized as English and for England to be taken seriously who wouldn't describe themselves as nationalists. They're, they're not drum-beating, tub-thumping nationalists. But then the history of the stories and the education is crucial. Um, if I can tell a story about a, a Sikh friend of mine in Southampton, just because it illustrates it, because it came to me when our, our military colleague was speaking earlier. Three years ago, uh, I, with a young Southampton Sikh councillor, Sapir Kaur, were, we were um, comparing a St. George's Day festival, okay, and we had to introduce the various different acts from all sorts of different communities. So what today's festival in Southampton, we say Southampton's a great English city, but it's always been made by all the people who live there. So it's open to everybody. Anyway, we had to introduce this South Asian, defiantly classical, South Asian classical dance crew. And we were thinking, how do we explain this on a St. George's Day event where half the people were expecting Morris dancers? Well, so what we did. We were talking, I've known Sapphire for a long time. Um, my uncle is on the war memorial in Southampton because he was torpedoed on his way to the Far East in 1944. Sapley's grandfather was a volunteer in the Imperial Army in the Far East in 1944. When you put those two stories together, you're no longer telling a story about a host community and strangers. You're talking about shared family histories, shared family willingness to sacrifice and loss and risk in a greater cause. And you change the whole debate. Now, one of the things that's gone wrong in our history, British Future does a wonderful job of this, you know, people have forgotten about the British Imperial Army. People who've grown up on Dunkirk don't know what actually happened in the Second World War. If you tell these histories, then you know why there's a Pakistani community, or there's an Indian community. You know, if you have the histories, why there's an East African community. And we do a very bad job about it not explaining these shared stories. And they're not about groups. They're about families that have been in the same places, done the same things. And if we did more of that, then we would have this would be a much easier process. Now I've made numerous films about that particular subject, about American yeah. Muslim soldiers, about we even followed this over the last four or five years while it was being built. Um, the problem is most people, if you were to wander around you know, Jewsbury, Bradford, places like that, and talk to people who are non-Asian, and you talk to them about this particular kind of history. You could go all the way back to King Offer and the relationship between Muslims and, uh, and Britain and England, etc. Um, they have no idea. So how do we go about doing that? You can't force people to sit down. You can't force people to sit down and watch programs. You can't force them to even, even in, uh, in classrooms often to actually teach this subject. Because it's, it's not a simple thing simply for teachers to go away from teaching the, the Tudor story to suddenly go into this. Now, I know there's an argument about the Tudor story is heavily linked, actually, to the Muslim world, and that's a whole different conversation. But how do we get people to understand this history when it's just not around us? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's got to start in schools, and the Conservative Party, certainly during the coalition years, and you know, we've done lots of talk thumping about how history should be taught, and we still haven't got it right. And, a very personal example for me is growing up at home on really, really strong stories about Salahuddin Ayubi and then going to school and being taught all about the Crusades and not working out that the two were the same story until years and years later when you brought it together and how it was so black and white at home and, and you know, Salahuddin Ayubi could do absolutely no wrong and it was so black and white at school where King Richard could have done absolutely nothing wrong. And had I been taught both the stories <laughs> together with a reflection on both sides and this, you know, history is not a science, then I would have been able to hopefully come back with a much more nuanced understanding. Now, there are certain things that kids, when you ask them about, would instinctively know about and the reasons behind and why it's important today. Holocaust education is a typical example of where we've, over the years, got it right because there's been a single-minded determination to teach it, to teach it, to teach it again and carry on teaching it and make it real for people uh, who are going through school. So until we get to that point where we feel that history is actually part of the 
process of underpinning a cohesive society in which people both matter and belong. Um, I don't think it's something you can do in later life. But I also think we should be quite upbeat about the progress we can make. I mean, I, I know it's frustrating. <laughs> you make the films, not enough people watch them, they don't change the world. Actually, bit by bit, that understanding spreads. The second thing is a generational change. Now, I know it's a cliche to talk about sport, but again, the British Future Survey showed that actually one of the things that united a huge amount of people this summer from across different faiths and groups was the England Fighting Football Tournament. You had two Muslim cricketers, one of whom was particularly strong on professing his faith, playing for England this summer. The generations are changing. These things are becoming things that you weren't doing 20 years ago. It didn't mean they weren't good Muslim cricketers 20 years ago, incidentally, but they weren't getting into the England team. So these things are changing. So let's look at the positive side. And I think events like this where people get together, it, it, it has an influence beyond the small garden in Woking. As people go out and say, there are stories that we can tell, there are ways of doing these things which will make a difference over time. And what we do all the time is you absolutely resist those people who say that, actually funny enough, England should be, England should be restricted to people like me who are white, they've got a name like Denham, which probably means my grandfather came over a thousand years ago with the Saxons. I mean, you, you have to fight everybody who tries to come up with that interpretation of history because it's wrong. One of my favourite stories about football is you should always remember that Premier League footballers actually know more about Islam than the most religiously literate about Islam people in the country. Yeah. We had this fantastic story of the uh, Liverpool, the doctor of Liverpool was a, a British Asian Muslim, and he told him he did a film about the Muslim Premier League, and he said um, when they won the League Cup, Stephen Gerrard came up to him, obviously way more educated than people giving credit for, and said, look, we're going to spray champagne around his lap, so if you want to come back in 20 minutes, we don't want really to embarrass you, because we know you don't drink, uh, he came back in 20 minutes and we were spraying the champagne around the dressing room. He came back 20 minutes later, his suit, his, his bag, his clothes, his shoes were all on the outside. Now, you want to talk about religious literacy? Yeah. Here's the life. We need yeah. to learn from Premier League footballers. Because I can guarantee you, if we went one time, went out the street and talked to people, yeah. they would not be able to yeah. not just know that, yeah. but actually have the, have the ability to actually do something about it. So he said, actually, they were annoyed him to death questions about Islam all the time. In fact, I wish they were a little bit more illiterate. But the fact of the matter is, we can learn from them. So in, actual, in, in the spirit of learning, what we're going to do now is actually throw this out now, so nobody's got any particular questions. I think, as this is probably the only roaming mic, unless there is a roaming mic wandering around, uh, I'll hand it over to Abes. First question. Uh, well, it's just really an observation. Um, it's been really interesting listening to uh, what you've been saying, what others have been saying. Like, you know, come down from Birmingham, uh, and I really had no idea what this, uh, you know, it's a very small event. I'm not obviously, judging the you know, quality by the number, but uh, I think, you know, the things that have been said uh, are you know, very important. And I'm well, you know, it's a very diverse community up there, and the sort of things that you've been mentioning and discussing are just uh, are, are not on most people's horizons at all. Uh, and I would just we just say just to you know, encourage more, you know, more of the same um, because it's you know, it is a very important. I think you made a very uh, wor worthwhile contribution to a very small audience, and there are a lot of people that uh, and communities that can benefit further uh, from the sort of issues that are opening up. So it's not a question, but just um, to share an observation. That's a good one, and I think there are events like this happening all over the place. But it's a very good point. Uh, anybody else? Another question? John? Um, can I ask again, uh, John Bingham from The Telegraph, um, can I ask again, Barnas Marty, you mentioned um, how uh, the decline of Christianity um, has made it harder um, to be uh, a member of a minority faith in the UK. Could you just spell that out a little bit more? Um, what sort of things do you mean by that? Um, I was going to not try and out you, John, actually, at this event. And <laughs> keep secret the fact that we have somebody here from the Telegraph. But John is actually one of the nicer guys at the Telegraph, so uh, we can all give him a cup of tea, actually, and a cake as well. So you're more than welcome to be here, John. Um, I mean, I refer you to my 2012 speech, John. I mean, we've spoken about this in the past. Um, 
one of the big concerns for me is if you are, uh, the Muslim community is quite young, uh, it's still fairly religious if you look at, the, and when I say religious, it's still fairly practicing in its faith. Uh, you compare that to the uh, British um, uh, social attitude survey uh, in terms of Christianity, where people, even when they say they are Christian, when you talk to them about the tenets of the faith, will say, yeah, but I wouldn't probably believe in those faiths, uh, those tenets of my faith. If you talk about people who identify as Christian but then don't necessarily attend church, but compare that to people who say, I'm Muslim, but I'm more likely than not to at some point have regular or fairly regular mosque attendance, you, you, you're left with a mainstream community which is becoming less religious, less Christian, less Anglican and a minority community, and not just Muslims, this is the same with Sikhs and Hindus and, and um, Orthodox Jewish communities who are still religious, still follow the tenets of the faith. And then, well, going back to what Tim has said, you have minority faith communities who are probably more old English than the English are out right now, which is why I said back in 2012, Europe needs to be sure about its own Christian heritage for me to be able to understand my minority faith and for that heritage to be accurately reflected in my river which flows over Bed Britain. So it's an argument which I consistently made in government. It wasn't particularly popular in a ever secular uh, society, an ever secular government. I mean, I used to, when I was the Minister for Faith, uh, there was a great catchphrase, they used to call me the Minister for Fairies, Goblins and Imaginary Friends. Um, and, and that was really kind of an indication, along with the kind of way in which we handled the papal visit, of how unfortunately policymakers see faith. So, you know, when we talk about English Islam, it's just as important for us to make the case for faith per se, as well as making the case for minority faiths and their identity within Britain. I'm going to go speak because I don't want to be out down on referring to previous speeches, but. Uh... <laughs> When I was Secretary of State for Cusins and Local Government, at that time, that job had the formal position of government in government in relations with faith. Now, I'm not a member of, I'm not a person of faith. I appointed, therefore, a panel of faith advisors and a special advisor in the department to make sure I understood the different faiths. Boy, did I get into trouble from the sort of a certain strand of, sort of philosophical liberal opinion who thought that it was absolutely appalling that a government minister should be engaging with faith at all because that was wrong. You know, it was really very, very hard, hard line from AC grading and people like that. Now, I made a speech in 2010 and followed it up in 2013, where I argued very strongly that one of the responsibilities of people who don't have faith, if you want society to work, is to recognize the responsibilities, to recognize the value that faith has to millions of our fellow citizens, and that good government meant taking that into account. If we did, even if we didn't share the theological beliefs that lie behind it. And I think that's enormously important. So I, you know, part of creating this culture you want requires, I think, people who personally would say, I don't have faith, to nonetheless acknowledge the importance that faith has in lives of many people. And if you're trying to build a nation, it's not going to be a faith nation, it's not going to be a Christian nation or a Muslim nation or any particular nation, but it's going to have a nation that has faith in it. Otherwise, you're just excluding millions of people of many different faiths before you start. And I think that's a very, very important argument. And I think the move towards secularization, which I suppose got, got into the, you know, we don't do God phrase of, of Alistair Campbell, is actually the wrong position to be in. And I think it's very difficult to say to somebody who's, who says, I'm motivated in my charity work and my community work by faith, to say, yeah, but I don't want to know that. Can you keep that out of the conversation? You can't let people in to tell everybody else they've got to be like that. That's proselytizing, that's not the role of public policy, but there's a happy medium. I think if I can just follow on that, that this real distinction between proselytizing and faith inspiring people yes. to do good was a, uh, was an argument that you know I kind of made in government. It's when I mean to yeah. take in Alistair Cabell's yes. words, I went on to say this government will do God and this government will get God. And what I meant by that is that the you know, plethora of organisations you have up and down the country, and when, I, I, when, when the attack did come from you know, what I coined then as secular fundamentalists, the argument I was making was that, well, what, would you want faith communities to vacate that whole space of food banks and homeless shelters and street masters and all the other work that they do, and would the secular society step up and just do all of that? Because what else makes somebody go out on a wet Friday night in 
Manchester to make sure people go home, like the <coughs> Christian street pastors do. They're not teaching anybody, they're not proselytizing their faith, but their faith is driving them, uh, driving them to do this. I hope that this, the Minister of Faith is going to return. Uh, it's something which certainly I used to sit at the cabinet table with. And you'll be surprised how many issues are affected by, uh, how many um, uh, issues of faith uh, affect a whole plethora of departments. I mean, let me take you to the food. Do you remember the uh, meat scandal, the horse meat scandal? And to try and say to the Environment Agency manager, you know, 0.111 whatever percent of horse meat isn't acceptable. It might be kind of acceptable Europe-wide, but if you're Jewish, you're just not going to eat horse meat. And it doesn't matter what percentage it is, you can't have a de minimis rule when it comes to certain foods and certain products. You can't have a de minimis rule on alcohol for certain communities. You can't have a de minimis rule for pork for certain communities. Actually, you've got to understand how faith communities work. So in the middle of the horse meat scandal, we were having meetings with rabbis and imams and trying to get all of that into the kind of right space. And I sincerely hope that you know, under Teresa, uh, she is somebody of faith. I think she understands faith. <coughs> she genuinely uh, respects faith. And I, and it, I hope that the Minister of Faith and its and its role within government does return. We need to go one step further, John, which is to say we live, it's, it seems bizarre the world that we're in today that we would be going backwards and we would be just diminishing the role of religion. It's understandable that in you know, the last 150 years or so in you know, post-Christian Europe that people may have got to that stage, but the rest of the world didn't live without religion and the rest of the world now lives in this in amongst us. And also because of digital technology, the rest of the world is, is, is as one very close as well. So to have a situation where suddenly we can have media outlets, as you know very well, uh, deciding that they don't want to have religious correspondence or the government for this media diminished, diminished, you know, all of these kinds, of, it seems like the wrong time. When we have such a lack of religious literacy and we have such a need to understand each other to actually turn our back on religion, it seems like the most serious decision ever. That's, what, that's my take on having been involved in this world for 15 years, which is to say, fighting against, you know, you know, if you want to understand the community cohesion, then you have to understand each other, don't you? And that's what events like this are all about. That's why making this program all those years, the last few years has been important. Why getting this together has been really important because this is something physical that you can show, that you can take people to, that you can point to and say, no, this really happened. Because as we do know, over time, people forget things happen. And if the lack of cultural and religious historical literacy isn't there, then nobody would have ever known that Muslim soldiers fought, fought and that 400,000 Indian soldiers fought. And of course, we must also remember there are North Africans, North African soldiers who uh, uh, were buried here as well from the Second World War, so it wasn't just Indian soldiers. Another question? That's not Jewish being told, is it? 
Good for you, Um I, I thought, Ray, you were going to ask, I don't know if it was the, the Telegraph, actually, was it the Sunday Telegraph, the front headline this week, or was it the Sunday Times, which said that Muslims didn't like Christmas trees? I thought you were going to tell us how Woking's Christmas tree every year is given by the Muslim Asian Bankers Association. I didn't have to do that, you've already done it. Muslims have 
right now is that they have an incredibly inward-looking version of their faith. But actually, it's a hugely international, outward-looking faith, always has been. And therefore, it is one of the easiest faiths to be able to go into a new space and make that space their home. And it's about giving people that confidence, which, say, my parents' generation didn't have, because for them, the more they integrated, the more they felt they lost lost whereas I think coming generations if they're going to you know if anything Islam has to be in tune with Britain otherwise I'm not sure in the long term it can sit as comfortably if it, if the environment on which it sits is comfortable with it. I think we need to keep an eye on it though. Because I think it's not a, I, I think if you look at other community groups that have come over, the traditional assimilation that seems to happen and people come become more middle class and by the more middle class, they tend to join in with post-Christian Europe and their religion, their religiosity seems to decline. But a lot of the studies that have been happening recently, is a very good one from uh, uh, Cardiff University, which, I look at, which, talks, which looks at young British Muslims and they are as religious, if not more religious, than their parents. And so because of that, it's less about them possibly in the future. You have a, you have a worry now about them trying to replicate the village in Pakistan, but they can't. That's their parents. That's their parents, right. But the next generation, the generation after them, may be replicating something else, or they may be trying to create, I should say, something else. And that won't be based on a cultural identity from their parents or grandparents or great grandparents, or their country of origin. It will be based on interpretation of religion and what they believe that religious identity will need to be. So I think we've got five to 10, 15 years to crack that, because if we don't crack it, if we think the Trojan horse was a one off, we may be living. So, Julie, you have got the last question. <coughs> That's always scary. Um, <coughs> Julie Steakey, I just want to congratulate the organisers, first of all, on creating what I think was quite a genius event, actually, in terms of the way you pulled the different strands together, particularly with the music. I think just kind of pulled so many strands. It was very moving. Um, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, thinking about some of the things that you've said, we are in a post-9, we, we have a post-9-11 generation, and you sort of briefly touched on history and how it's not really done well in schools, you know, I don't think it's okay for us to just accept that history is not done well enough in schools. You know, my kids come home and talk about how in the playground, you know, references to suicide bombers and stuff is supposed to be banter that people are just supposed to accept now as being okay. And it strikes me, when you spoke about Holocaust kind of education, it's the Jewish community themselves that have really been very, very um, passionate and very much put a lot of effort and money, I guess, into that kind of education. It hasn't been done by government, of course, it's been taken on, but I know some of the charities, they're, they're absolutely um, determined to make sure that, that doesn't, and it just strikes me that as Muslims, there is a role for us to actually play a much more proactive role in that teaching of history and how we link people together and belong in identity in schools, perhaps, and also communities. But how do we do that when we have a community that actually feels under the spotlight constantly and young people who are made to question their identity when they probably wouldn't normally want to? You know, my kids don't want to be questioned about who they are or what they are. They just want to be themselves. And yet their reference to this kind of terrorism, etc., puts them off as well. So we're almost in danger of making people a confused generation. And I feel like we have to take a role here and be positive and proactive. But how are we going to do that when a community feels so under pressure as well, I think it's hard. Well, when you both answer that, can you also factor in what you did about this when you were in cabinet as well? Mm -hmm. You were in cabinet as well, so it's not about it was somebody else's problem, it was partly your problem as well. Yeah. Uh, so specifically, kind of what we did in, in government, when we tried to look at this in, in government, Julie, it was very hard to find a single issue around which a lot of British Muslims could get behind to be able to use as a tool to be able to educate. And so um, I developed a project back in 2008. Many of you will recognize it now before we went into government with a view to absolutely delivering it in government to make it a hub around which we could then start to talk about a shared history and an understanding of, say, persecution and, and Muslims. And it was the Remembering Srebrenica program. It was almost impossible to get off the ground once we got into government, but it was almost impossible to get the community to get behind it in the outset. 
now, looking at it four or five years on, it is an amazing project, hundreds of programs across the country, but also dealing with a very contemporary issue of Islamophobia in Europe, but referring it back to a European shared history. The big iftar, something that you know we've worked on in, in government. We remember, too, um, a, a way in which we talked about um, commemoration of um, uh, our armed forces at a time when the you know, Mad Angel Chowdhury, the poppy burning stuff was uh, going on. The Big Iftar was a take on the Big Lunch, getting people uh, into, uh, into mosques. There were lots and lots of little things that we tried to do to try and get that conversation going. But sadly, you know, the, one of the challenges we have with British Muslim communities is that, you know, although it's now, you know, maybe on a war footing because of the war on terror, this has been a community which has been at war during peacetime. And, and one of the most difficult things for me has been, and again, this is one of the things I'm writing about at the moment, is you know, the development of the community leader and community leadership uh, hasn't necessarily equipped British Muslim communities to adopt those positions of leadership. And I think we're ending up with a new generation of community leadership, which is about doing rather than just saying and being, which is what a lot of people in the past did. That combined with what I think John did amazing work on, but I think his colleagues didn't, and my colleagues made it even worse, was this policy of disengagement from government. There's been a consistent policy of disengagement where groups and individuals and activists have been seen as beyond the pale. More and more people have been seen as not being appropriate to engage or speak to, or partner with or talk to. And over time, that's resulted in a community leadership which is not developing. And it's struck in a time warp because Literally, they're not, you know, they're, there's just no process in which to bring on new community leadership. Uh, again, I think Theresa's government has a real opportunity to move away from this policy of disengagement. John tried really hard before 2010 to try and get over that hurdle. I'm not saying a lot of these older community leaders are the solution, but I, I am also, I am saying you cannot put large sections of community leaders, organizations on the outside and then wonder why the community can't step up. I, would, I agree with Sailor, and, and, and thanks for what you said. I mean, the, the particular thing that I tried to do towards the end of the Labour government was to change the nature of at least part of the prevent programme. And there is a fundamental problem with the prevent programme during most of the time it's operation, that it has, it has believed in what's called the slippery slope theory of radicalisation, that you come across somebody with a small c conservative interpretation of faith that leads to a series of stages towards you becoming a terrorist, which is about as logical as saying that if somebody's a Roman Catholic, they're nine tenths a terrorist for the Republican army. I mean, it, is, it isn't the way it works. It's the combination, the political circumstances, the political issue that makes the difference. As we've seen, lots of actual radicalization takes place very rapidly amongst people with no discernible depth of knowledge of their religion or, or whatever. Uh, and so we've had an approach to the prevent program that has actually tended to make things worse rather than better, because it has tended to label people by the, the theology they believe in, rather than their attitude to the political question of is it okay to use violence to pursue against civilians to su pursue your political aims, and that's been I think a big a, a big problem, um, and it was a problem under the Labour government that I am part trying to tackle. Although I, if I'm honest, I don't there's more of a difference in the speeches to what actually happened on the ground, because turning the super tank around is difficult, and things have gone back in the other direction. The second thing is we haven't, an issue I was also involved in, we haven't actually equipped the people to do the job we want them to do. So let's take the issue of schools education, something I did an inquiry into when I ran the Home Affairs Select Committee. Most teachers did not want to have these issues discussed in the classroom. I mean, as she said, we're not entirely sure what the difference between Saddam Hussein and Bin Laden is. You know, this was dangerous. So, so schools, instead of providing a space where very difficult, controversial issues could be discussed, tended to close it down. Did that mean the kids didn't discuss them? No. I mean, they went on the internet, they went to all sorts of dangerous places with dangerous people, where people were going to give them the space to discuss them. You can't expect teachers to know all this stuff. And we're doing the same now with the teaching of British values. You know, it comes up. Schools have got to teach these values. No explanation of where they came from. And if you take one that's central to what we're talking about today, religious tolerance, 
unless you understand that this country came to religious tolerance after several hundred years of enthusiastically trying out all the alternatives to religious tolerance, you know, killing people, burning kings, you know, civil wars, all the rest of it, you don't understand why it is such an important value. If you just say, you've got to have religious tolerance because we're British and it says so in the law, you're not equipping anybody to understand it. And so if you're having an argument, for example, about violence and about tolerance, understanding what used to happen in this country and most of Western Europe when there wasn't religious tolerance is really very useful. It's a way of getting across why it matters so much to us. So two things there. I mean, the Prevent program, I think, went off in the wrong direction and, and does need pulling around, and I hope that happens under a new government. And if we want schools to take on this issue, we must train them. We'll spend money and resources on equipping people who don't deal with these issues in their everyday life to be able to handle them. And of course, both Tim and I are involved with the curriculum for cohesion. So if anybody wants to get involved, and that is an yeah. organisation which is trying to give a more inclusive history into the, into the yeah. uh, national curriculum. It is possible to tweak things. There's a really good book I recommend you all read that's just come out. I think it's written by an academic called Jerry Broughton, which is about the relationship between um, the Reformation, and the early days of the Reformation, and the survival of this country and the military pacts with the Ottomans and the North African uh, Arab uh, empires as well. And without the Muslim armies and that direct relationship, which you can find the letters written in Arabic in the archives between the Queen and the Ottoman Sultans, etc., we would not have defeated the Spanish Armada. So that you can tweak the, we can tweak the Spanish Armada story and we can tweak the uh, Tudor story to just have that little bit in. We don't necessarily have to have a whole semester or a whole term, as it were, just based around a particular subject, which may feel difficult, difficult, difficult for the teachers to suddenly have to do. Because even if they want to teach a subject, they don't have the uh, training and resources and facilities. So curriculum for cohesion, please go on the website and get involved and join in. And actually, you know, all you've got to do is just get in touch with the education department and say, we can tweak this slightly and give that every single bit of the national curriculum, particularly in history, can be tweaked slightly to give that that relationship between British Islam and the British state. Anyway, I think that's the end of it today. I just want to say thank you to John and to Saida, and I think to hand back over to Aves. So thank you very much. Thank you.